Hello, peace, love, and light, everyone. My name is Aliyah Oliver, and I'm a Programs and Media Associate at the Caribbean Cultural Center African Diaspora Institute. We are an arts, culture, education, and media organization that advances cultural equity and racial and social justice for African descendant communities. On behalf of the center, I want to welcome you all to Sankofa Talks, a series of intergenerational talks between artists, activists, and educators of the African diaspora. Translated from the Twi language of the Akan people of Ghana, West Africa, Sankofa means to go back and get it. And it speaks to the importance of gathering up those lessons from our past and using them to create our future. So for Black August, where we honor the work of our revolutionaries and educate ourselves on the histories of our resistance as a people, these Sankofa talks will highlight the culture bearers that continue in the work of our ancestors and agitate for our liberation as a people in all spheres of access, identity, and belonging. And in order to keep things interesting, CCC ADI has selected participants that have never before met. Um, so not only is this the first time that they're getting to know each other, but we've, we've also created some questions to help them get to know each other. Um, so without further ado, enjoy tonight's Sankofa talk. Boricua identity in Black movements. Hello. Hello. How are you, Iman? I'm great. How are you? Very well. It's so nice to like actually get to meet you, like virtually. I was gonna say like in person, but virtually, um, because this is the closest to in person. I don't know if you know, but I have been looking up to you and the Young Lords ever since I was 14, 15 years old. Um, and they are who inspired me to do the work that I do and are like just a, a symbolic representation of my identity in this city and um, has just given me so much light and courage to continue doing this work. And so it is such an honor to be here, like, and speaking to you. I cried, just so you know, like, when oh, I found out. Lindo, que lindo. Listen, <laughs> yeah. I, thank you very much for that. I, I am proud of you. I saw you on Channel 7, and I flipped out. I said, do you mean to tell me we ha I've lived long enough to see the manifestation of our wishes in a young Middle Eastern Puerto Rican woman? This is unbelievable. I thought you were wonderful in the interview, by the way. So I asked God years ago, if you don't kill me now, let me live long enough to see the next generation. And I'm seeing it. And, and Aliyah, you did very well too, babe. You did wonderful. Anyway, now uh, introductions. Let me introduce to our audience who this young woman is. Her name is Iman Abdul. Uh, she was born and raised in Brooklyn. Uh, and it's, she's made it her responsibility to elevate the many communities of which she represents. Um, she is uh, Lebanese and Puerto Rican. Think about it. And by the way, both cultures look alike. Yeah. You know, tell one from the other. Uh, and I keep on telling Puerto Ricans that we are really basically an Arab people. If you think that Spain was taken over by um, Muslims for 750 years, it's no mistake that we look alike. Um, at 18, uh, she, um, she became a founding member of a group called Integrate New York City, where youth design, design and push out the solutions for an integrated, equitable, and just public school system, which I'm gonna ask you about, because I think that's great. Um, she's a Generation, generation Z uh, art, artivist, they call it? What yeah. does artivist mean? What does artivist mean? It's like when you're an artist and an activist, and when you use art to elevate your activism and right the on. different mediums of art. Right on. Storyteller, mm -hmm. she's creative. Um, she um, contains, she has leadership roles within Strategy for Black Lives, a black youth-led organization on the front lines of New York City's protest for black just, justice, and Global Girlhood, uh, a youth-led community that uses authentic storytelling to revolutionize representation of women in media, education, and leadership. What I like about it, she's a past recipient of the Com Comité Noviembre Scholarship, and you got to be heavy to do that. And she's... Um, what else does it say here that knocked me out? She's a delegate of the International Congress of Youth Voices. Um, and here, check this out, y'all. She's also co-collaborated and released her very own sneaker with Nike. Inspired by the Daily Book. Go, Iman. Go. I love it. Um, as a queer Middle Eastern Afro-Indigenous Boricua, 
Iman plans to continue inspiring young people alike to take action while creating what most represents and empowers them. I think that's a powerful, powerful resume. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, now I'm going to introduce you. And so, born in 1947 in East Harlem, New York, Felipe Luciano is a prominent and dynamic Afro-Puerto Rican public figure in the Latinx community and one of its foremost activists, lecturers, writers, and journalists. He is a two-time Emmy Award-winning reporter and was the first Puerto Rican news anchor of a major media network station in the United States at WNBC-TV New York. In 1969, he co-founded New York City's Young Lords Party, for which he also served as chairman. He currently hosts Latin Roots on WBAI in New York, which he originally founded and produced in 1972 as the first English language program in the U.S. to feature Latin culture and music to develop an ethnically and racially diverse audience. That is like... That is so dope. And that explains how you like saw my ABC stuff too, because you were at WNBC. Um, and you just do all of this dope work. And you're also a poet and part of yeah. the last poets. Um, and I and a lot of people do not know about the last poets. I didn't even know about the last poets until I took an Afro Boricua class in college. Um, and so it is such it is such an honor for this Thank conversation. You, very much. you know, we were the we were the first ones to begin to use spoken word with music. Yes. It hadn't been done before. Uh, out of that came rap, out of that came spoken word. So we are uh, very proud being the grandfathers, if you will, or the pioneers in the rap movement. Literally like the foundation, part of the foundation. Part of the foundation. Of course, you got to give credit to a guy named Amiri Baraka, who is uh, the man. And for those of you who don't know him, he was the, uh, for us, one of the pioneers of this movement. Um, his two books, uh, uh, Blues People, and what is what is the other one, Tanka, that we have up there that you read all the time? The Black, uh, read Amiri Baraka. <laughs> if you get any poetry, you can. I, of course I put you on the spot. Um, get, uh, get any of those books and you will see words come to life. He believes uh, he's passed. He believes that uh, poetry, words have to be like bullets. And so I think, and then I'm going to let you speak, Iman, because I, te I tend to keep on speaking and not stop. Iman, he believes that the all revolutions start with culture, and so do I. It starts with culture. Yes. Writers, dancers, sculptors, painters, poets, um, all of musicians, it starts there. That's where the re revolution begins, because when people develop a consciousness, through hearing, through seeing, they then begin to take that consciousness into physical action. So I think the revolution um, is always started by the cultural folk. That is so powerful. I agree. Tell me something. Uh, I want to hear about your work on education. You believe that, um, that the New York City school system is segregated. I don't know how you came to that conclusion. Um, and you were very strong about it. Uh, you're saying it's not an equitable education. Explain that. Yeah. Um, so New York City has the most segregated public school system in the entire country. And it's really hard to believe given that like we are so racially um, and ethnically and religiously diverse in our city alone. But you see within boroughs and you see within even single neighborhoods that you have one school that's predominantly black and brown, mm -hmm. and then you have another school that's predominantly white. And these are both public schools. And you look at the differences in these schools. You look at who are their teachers. You look at which students are walking through metal detectors. You look at which schools have more sports teams, more AP um, classes, more language classes, um, which schools have the technology and the resources, which schools even have teachers that look like these students hmm. um, but yeah this this is like why um I was just like a student in high school high school I was like I'm not in classes where students look like me and this is a problem well um, I, I I think um I have a feeling that prophets and visionaries 
are uh, prodded by God. This is going to sound a bit weird to you, um, but I believe that you were made to be this way, that that is your historical, metaphysical, spiritual mandate. Even if you tried to run away from it, truth has to be uh, truth is a virtue. There's a very famous German philosopher named Nietzsche who says truth is true, uh, that virtue, the truth is the best virtue you can have. And what you saw, the reality of what you saw is what caused you to speak out on it. And I'm very proud of you for doing that because the reality is that public education, Iman, is the, is the greatest national security asset. You, if you don't have people who know what the history is, who know what the um, what the separation of powers is, who know what the Federalist Papers are about, who know why we are who we are, even with white men who were slave owners. You got to know the underpinnings of the United States, which is why the United States, which is why I love the people's history of the United States by Howard Zinn. When people understand what the deal is, then you truly can call yourself a citizen. Then nobody can take you over. Nobody, no fascist, no authoritarian person can say this is the way the law is because you know the law. So the fact that you are doing this um, is really revolutionary. And I think that the revolution really is not on the streets. It's in public schools. Thank you. It really does start in public schools. <laughs> but we'll get back that back to that in a little bit. Okay. Um, so I'll start with our icebreaker question. So name your favorite way to decompress. Swimming in the Caribbean in Puerto Rico. Would I be lying if I said that mine is the same thing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That is so funny that you say that because you took the answer right out of my mouth. That's the best way for me to decompress. Yes. And why is that? Because there is a silence in Puerto Rico with all of the noise, with all of the, the oh yeah, we got that and all that stuff. <laughs> there is a silence in nature. Uh, and when I go to a place called Rincón, Mm -hmm. my favorite beach called Bouye in Cabo Rojo. And I jump in that water and I swim. I start to pray. I really, I feel prayer. And I look up as I'm stroking and I'm going like this and I'm putting my arm up, I'm looking at the sun and I go back down and I, I am praying. And all of the, all of the challenges, all of the conflicts go away. Um, I'm using my entire body and I love it. I'm gulping in water. I'm blowing through my nose so that I'm, I'm making sure that the water doesn't get into my nose. I'm having a wonderful time. I am totally at peace when I'm doing that. That's my decompression. What is it's yours? Beautiful. Mine is the same. Mine is going back home to Puerto Rico and just swimming in the ocean. Um, it's like, and when I go there, I pray as well. I feel like it's such a healing and safe space for me. It's like an escape from all of the trauma and bullshit that we deal with like on our daily lives, going back home and reconnecting with our land and reconnecting with the water. Like I sit like on on where um on the shore, like where the waves come at its like strongest. And I let them just take over me and I pray and I cry sometimes because I just feel so connected. Like I feel like everything around me is so connected and I feel so grounded and so myself, like my 100% authentic self. And then at nighttime, the sound of the cookies is like what seals the deal. Like that's how I know like that I'm safe, that I'm at my fullest, I'm at my happiest and going home is always the hardest, but that is my- I, I get sick two days before I go home. <sighs> Because of the change of weather? No, because I have to go home. I have to oh. come back to New York. I get very yeah. down. Yeah, it's so, it's, yeah, your mental just really gets to you because it just proves that we belong there and, like, we are connected to that. You know what's lovely about this, Iman? That I am listening to my younger generation, what I helped to create, prove that the DNA in, in us is so strong that it is that it, it will pull us back. Puerto Rico is pulling me back. It's going to pull you back. It does that. Now, whether you go to stay or to make a significant contribution, it is there. Puerto Rico right now needs every one of us 
to help it grow so that it can mature and it can become independent. Mm -hmm. Right now, there are 30 youth groups in Puerto Rico who are doing their best. What I help to create. Are we going backwards? I hear myself. In in us is so strong. All right, so now what's happening is I believe God is calling us back. I believe our people are calling us back and saying, Iman, come on over, come on over. Felipe, come on over. Stay with us a while. If you want to live here, we'll get you a house. But stay with us for a while and teach us and let us teach you. Because it's important that there be reciprocity. It's not just us giving to them. They have to give to us because we're kind of hard around the edges, you know. So we need to be a little softer. And I used to hate that. I used to say Puerto Ricans um, are too passive. Well, and I'll say this quickly. Iman, I was with an Indian princess, a Taina. Her name is uh, Anaka. And I said, why were, why were Tainos so passive? And she looked at me. She sat back in her chair and she said, Papi, what are you talking about? There was no passivity here. We fought from the time these suckers got here. And she gave me a chronological rundown of what the Tainos did. And I started to cry. I started, I was bawling like a baby. And she said, you're bawling because you know that inside your heart, what I'm saying is true. And then she brought me into the back of her house and she had all the semis, all of the uh, petroglyphs. I mean, it was unbelievable. Uh, I just loved it very much. And I began, I was transformed there. Uh, I'm a warrior. I have fought very hard for Puerto Rican independence. I believe in it. I never thought I was gonna live this long, but I've lived long enough to see where I have gone wrong in terms of viewing Puerto Rico as totally passive, as people who don't wanna fight, because I come from a position of confrontation. My thing is punch the boy in his face, but not every, you know, you have to understand what happened in Puerto Rico, the colonialism in Puerto Rico, the colorism in Puerto Rico, the sheer racism in Puerto Rico, all of that you have to understand. And then understand that we still have remained an island, an island that's built on family todavía. So it's something that I had to understand. And I was transformed. When I came back, I was talking not as hard as I'm talking now, it was very soft. Puerto Rico makes you, um, malleable. God can use you in Puerto Rico. I think you're going back. I think I'm going back too because I was just looking at apartments like two two weeks ago. Like I want to go back home, especially yeah, now with COVID. There's not much to do here. So, that, wow. Like it's just crazy. I find it extremely, extremely powerful how like just through generations you see this pattern of all of us still reconnecting to our land and reconnecting to our family and to our ancestors and just truly internalizing that and using our culture and our identity to transform ourselves when we come back here. Um, and that's actually what I go like to Puerto Rico for. I try to go now, like I'm a college student, so I don't even have much money, but anything I have, I try to go twice a year just to go back for a few days and reconnect and learn and grow. And I find it extremely interesting that like, even in Puerto Rico, like when I talk to my cousins, like my entire family is there. My mother was born and raised there. So my mother came here. What town? What town? (coughs) We're from Salinas. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful town. Thank you. (laughs) It's a seaside seaside town. Yes, yes. We're very famous for our seafood. (laughs) Um, so we're from Salinas, um, but my mother was like born in Caguas and lived in Calle. And so my family is like all like in Calle, Guayama, Salinas, like all in, in the Midwest, like, I'm sorry, in the mid, in the middle down to the South. And so when I go there, like, and I speak to my cousins about Lolita Lebron. Help it grow so that it can. Um, when I go and I speak to my cousins about Lolita Lebron, they have no idea who she is. Yeah. Like, well, you know, history, history, that happens in history. Um, yeah. there, there are people who still think Malcolm X means Malcolm 10 in Roman numerals. Um, it, it happens. But what's important is that those warriors who have been selected by the universe um, will get the information. Those who have ears, let them hear. Let the, Those who have eyes, let them see. And you will be doing that. I know it happened to me and it will happen to you. Now I'm getting even a deeper knowledge of Puerto Rico um, and it's been transformative. We're at some point, um, we have given so much here. We need to go back 
and help our people there. Because if you don't have an island base, what do you have? You need to have a foundation and the island has a foundation. I think we've had a tremendous influence. Um, we're gonna have a tremendous influence in um, Puerto Rico um, and Cuba and Santo Domingo and Brazil. I think the Caribbean is going to be the epicenter of the new love movement. People are gonna go there to find out how how is it that you guys with all of the race problems, all of the class problems, still have a coolness to you? Uh, uh, um, a tropical uh, veneer that really is beautiful. How do you do that? How is it that you have less nervous breakdowns than other nations? How do you do that? Um, I love the kids in Puerto Rico. I don't know if you've ever seen it. They are absolutely gorgeous. They're gorgeous, those kids. They say, buena, buena noche, buen provecho. I go around, I can't believe it. They're beautiful. Um, I think that Puerto Rico has put itself down enough. You know yeah. what I mean? We have a colonial attitude of self-deprecation. I think it's time to get past that. We have so much to contribute to the world, Iman, not only to ourselves, but to the world. But I, and I think in light of that, I think we've also contributed to the movement here. Um, Puerto Ricans in black movements have done a lot to open up the political and cultural and spiritual syndrome so that we're not caught up in, um, a victim, a victimization thing. It's opened up. We've done a lot here. We've done a lot to uh, interact and interface with black movements, which is what we're supposed to be talking about. How do Boricuas re relate um, in black movements? How do you, Iman? Um, what, so what, does black, what does black liberation mean and look like to you? As a Boricua, black liberation means and looks like to me just ending colorism, ending colorism amongst ourselves and elevating um, our, our darker skinned brothers and sisters and giving them the platform and the resources that they were denied or didn't have access to. Um, it means educating our future Boricuas on the history and culture and efforts of our black people back, back home. It means like talking much more about Don Pedro Alviso Campos than, than just on like, both have to pick up from the library if you want to learn about him. This should be something that everybody knows about um, since you're a child. It also means like black liberation means teaching our young people that, teaching our young black people that we were not born on the foundation of slavery and that does not define us. I feel like a lot of times, oftentimes, black and brown children are taught at a very, very young age that black is bad, black is no good, you, you are descendants of slaves. And I feel like this entire narrative really needs to stop because instead of empowering us, it really like brings us down. And that's why a lot of black and brown youth tend to not believe in themselves to the fullest because they will always feel that white is superior to them. And so I think just really like having these dialogues, changing the curriculums within our school system, fighting for policies and for um, community resources to elevate um, our, our black Boricuas and our, and our entire black community in general. Wonderful. And now ask me a question. So what does it look like and mean to you? I have been fighting for black Puerto Rican unity for more than 50 years. I'm always amazed when I see Afro Latinos saying we want recognition. I've been doing that for 50 years. Now I'm not, I'm not mad at it at all. In fact, I'm very proud of them. I'm very proud to have been one of the people who was instrumental in the foundation of that. But I think besides having the identity racially, we have to go beyond that to be a political entity. So the fact that I'm a black Puerto Rican is one thing. What are you doing? How are you following in the tradition of Schomburg? How are you following in the tradition of um, Emeterio Petances, who was also half black? How are you following in the tradition of all of the people who've been fighting there for a long time? Um, it is not your identity that makes you who you are. It's your service to the community. That's why I say we have to be careful with false criteria for nationalism. I hinted that they're saying, 
tú no hablas español, tú no, tú no puedes ser boricua. I get mad at that. You don't speak Spanish, therefore you can't be Puerto Rican. Uh, they have to hold me back from, from, from crushing those guys' throats because in the young ones, we used to have to say, take, we, we had a saying, Tengo Puerto Rico en mi corazón. It has nothing to do with how straight your hair is, how nappy your hair is, how Indian you look. What it has to do with is service to your community. So I have been working in the black community for years. My mother um, was a black Puerto Rican. My grandmother was a black Puerto Rican. Um, and when I was born, they were going to make me an honorary white because in those days, in the 40s, what they did is when you were born, they would list you as white. It didn't matter how blue you were. And it was my grandmother who told the doctor, she tapped him on his shoulder. She said, you colorblind? So I ended up being called a you know, Negro Puerto Rican when they said my race. So my race is black uh, and my nationality is Puerto Rican. And I wish we get more Puerto Ricans to understand that. Um, so I grew up with in, in East Harlem with blacks and Italians and Jews um, mainly with black Southerners. And I grew up with black folk who had fled the South and who were so angry at, at being treated badly that they would never allow people to disrespect them up here. There were things that happened that were horrible, but they, they used to tell me there was nothing as bad as being in the South and having to succumb to some sheriff. So the first thing I learned about black folks, especially the Geechees, I'd say this all the time from South Carolina, is the best answer to social injustice after you tried and tried and tried is a punch in the face. So when I grew up with South Carolinians, they said, what? They used to tell me, why are you taking that from that boy? Knock him out. And I learned that there's a way to reason, but after reason, you gotta move forward. That's why you'll never see me criticizing Black Lives Matter. You never see me criticizing people looting. I understand the, the anger that comes out. So I grew up believing that there is no difference between me and a black man in this city. There may be cultural uniqueness. You know, uh, we like the Gran Combo. We like Eddie Palmieri. You know what I'm saying? Uh, we celebrate uh, El Dia de Reyes. But mm -hmm. in the end, we are all black. And in this country, it doesn't matter um, what you think you are. You can In Puerto Rico, we have different racial categories. You would be called mulata in Puerto Rico. Here, here you are black. I would be called mulato in Puerto Rico. Here you you know here I'm black so we learn to do that. I'm also loving the fact that more and more of uh, more and more dark Puerto Ricans are calling themselves black Puerto Ricans and beginning to identify with the Afrocentric movement. I think that's wonderful. God bless you for doing that because you know a lot of Middle Easterners still don't want to say they're black. They deny it all the time, and and they really like jack their French colonial like heritage and it's just so stressful that like at the end like how bad people want to identify with their colonizers only in terms of what it means to be successful in society yeah. um and so yeah i think it's it's very empowering also for me to like identify as an afro boricua like specifically calling out my black heritage on the island um my my great grandmother is a black woman who married a light skinned Puerto Rican. And like and that's how like all of us now look all mixed. We have some darkers than others. And that's just most Puerto Rican families. Like that's, that's what we are. Um, but just really like grounding ourselves to to appreciating our our black culture and identifying with my grandmother as a black woman and saying like, yeah, this is who I am and this is what I am going to carry out. And I just wanted to comment back on what you were saying about how Puerto Ricans like, or just Latinos or people in general tend to diminish Puerto Ricans that do not speak Spanish. And and something I've also been struggling with like my whole life being a New Yorican, they're like, oh, like, being a Puerto Rican is cool and all until you can't speak Spanish. And they always like make fun of us until like, it wasn't until I started educating myself on why do New Yorkans or most New Yorkans not speak Spanish? And like breaking that down to the systems and, and into back in the seventies, the whole Puerto Rican civil rights movement, how we had to fight for bilingual classes, how if you didn't speak English, you were put in special ed classes as a Puerto Rican or black kid. Like all of, all of the ways that the system had 
chat. And just because I do not speak this language, like, does not mean that I do not do what I need to do for my community and represent it to the extent that I need to, because there are a lot of Puerto Rican people that I know that speak Spanish that do not do anything for Listen, our community. Right. We, we learned in the Young Lords, language has nothing to do with revolutionary spirit. Yep. You know, you can you can speak all the Spanish you want as the as as black people black people say, man, that that mira mira don't know how to speak Spanish. They used to call us mira miras. Mira, but let me mira. tell you something. Yeah, but very often the fact that you speak Spanish, uh, not very often, but just that you speak Spanish doesn't doesn't elevate you to any position. So what? And by the way, um, that attitude about people speaking Spanish used to be prevalent in Puerto Rico. It's dying rapidly. After uh, the hurricane that hit Puerto Rico and after the billions of dollars that we sent over there, which was robbed by not only the governor, but his wife and a bunch of other people, um, they now respect us a lot more. And I sat down with some elders all over, especially in Santurce, and they, they admit that we are a special breed. Yes, we are Puerto Rican, but Puerto Ricans in New York, New York Ricans are a special breed. We don't take it. We're not having it. We'll stand up and we'll also back you up. We're about family. So we sent thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions over there. Um, unfortunately, it was robbed. And unfortunately, the government there left it in the airports. They let the black, they let the black market take over. I'm so annoyed at what happened. Um, there was no unified action against it. But eventually, the people of Puerto Rico, a million strong, took to the highways and got this sucker out. I'll say you. They got him out. We what I'm trying to say is that false criteria for nationalism should never be allowed to determine whom we love and whom we don't. I'll be very open about it, Iman. I am. I believe in the independence of Puerto Rico. I believe it with all my heart, with all my soul. And I think if we put ourselves on the line, and yes, some of us will die, but you know something? It is better uh, to fight for that than to continue this colonial situation where the chains have been taken. Off your, off your hands and put around the brain. Yes. So you have people yes. saying, no, yo soy blanco. And, and by the way, most Latinos, when they get the census, they say we're white and the guy's blue. And my thing is, when you look at what the Spaniards did, they said for every color graduation, for every color variant, I will give a social status. So the top of the line is the whites. And we call them, we don't call them black, blancos, we call them rubios, the top of the line. Yeah. Then you go down the line. Then you get mulatto. Then you get grifo. Then you get Hawao. Then you get uh, uh, indio, achinao, uh, moreno. Until you get to the point where when you say black, the only real black in Puerto Rico, according to them, is prieto. Yeah. So now you have all of these levels of, of color graduation, of color status, each one with a social status, each one with a certain hair texture, each one with a certain lip configuration, each one with a noise configuration. If your nose is too flat, um, you're prieto. By the way, we have people who are very white in Puerto Rico, we call them grifos, they're, they're white. They have straight hair, but they have African features. So we call them grifo. You, you, the, it's, it's endless, the amount of uh, categorization that we have in Puerto Rico. So what we're gonna have to do is learn to love those people and you love them anyway and work toward the liberation of our island. And I think I was saying in the beginning that there are 30 youth groups that are reclaiming land. They're going back and reclaiming land. And this is um, an admonition to all who are listening. I have money, but... To all who are listening, if you have money, if you have any money, invest in the land in Puerto Rico, invest in your island, invest in it. If you got 5,000, if you got 1,000, invest in something in Puerto Rico that's yours. Get a piece of the rock, not the United States, Puerto Rico. I love that you said that. And we're going to get to our next question as soon as I respond. But, like, everything you're saying right now is connecting to, like, my thoughts just this past, like, quarantine. I've really been thinking about Puerto back Rico. For a few ¿Qué pasó? What happened? I don't, I don't know why it, like, Keep really talking. Happened. Keep talking, dear. But, um, anyways, so when I was just thinking about this and as I was saying how I was like looking for a place like to move to in Puerto Rico, like I do not want to stay in an apartment unless it is something I own, but like I want to have my own land in Puerto Rico. I want to grow my own 
agriculture and my land. They, they've taken our sugar, they've taken our platano, they've taken every single thing from us and have brought it to the United States and have profited off of all of our resources. And it's so draining like that this cycle keeps continuing and then the Puerto Rican people are now declaring debt for America's <laughs> issue in the first place. Um, and it's just so like frustrating, but also like something that I believe every young Puerto Rican person should do Go back home, invest in land, invest in your community, um, because that's really the only way that we'll really be able like, to take over and have control of what goes on when we own it. And something like I just wanted to add is like, I was just in Puerto Rico um, at the end that's of June. Thank you. And <laughs> I was just in Puerto town. Rico at yeah. the end of June. And- um, It's for our seafood. <laughs> Keep talking. I'm sorry. I was just there and there was this white man that was at the beach and he had said like, oh, he told me and my friends, oh, we're in Puerto Rico. We've been here for the past three months during quarantine. We're here in Aguadilla. We're thinking of buying a house here. It's only $600,000, but in the US it would be like X million dollars. And I was just looking at him and I, my mind you, there was a Puerto Rican kid with me and he was like, oh yeah, man, you should definitely go and buy this house. This is the best place to buy it. Like the market is is low. And he was advertising our island for sale to a white man in front of me. And that was the most frustrating thing ever because I was like, no, and I told the man, I was like, no, sir, I think you have to really understand like the situation that Puerto Rico is in and is in this second does not call for you or any of your people to come and move into our communities, not understanding that this house that you're buying, the person that lived there most likely couldn't even afford it anymore and couldn't afford to live back in our land. And that's why they were pushed out and forced to move out. And that is why you are buying their home for cheap. And and like, this is not welcome here. And like, I got into a whole argument, but yeah. Congratulations. That is wonderful. You, you kicked his ass in a nice, subtle way, but you kicked his ass. And, uh, and that's important. Let him know. Now it's for him to think about it. But we had to, somebody had to tell him he's not welcome. Well, I call it island gentrification. What happened with Maria is that um, it was the perfect opportunity for the exploiters to come in uh, and take the land. The banks foreclosed on a lot of those properties. And when they were asked, the Puerto Rican people were asked um, when they were looking for loans so that they could help um, their mothers, their fathers, their grandmothers and grandfathers to keep the house, they asked them for deeds. Now in Puerto Rico, land is passed from mother to father, from mother to son, and from father to daughter um, verbally. Yes. And unfortunately, a lot of the people didn't have the deeds and they were not allowed to, to uh, take out loans. It's so sad. But what they want, they're gentrifying the island. What the Americans want to do, particularly on the East Coast, is they're tired of the Hamptons. They're tired of Nantucket. They're tired of uh, Martha's Vineyard. They want Puerto Rico. They're tired of the winters. So they want to take over Puerto Rico and make that the ha the the, uh, the, the um, East Hamptons of, of, of this part of the world. They're doing it. They're, and they're buying those homes left and right. We have the money to do it. We need to do it. And I promised myself that I would buy a house in Puerto Rico. I want to buy one here too, but I promised myself that I would buy, uh, I happen to like the West Coast of Puerto Rico much more than the East Coast, but I promised myself I would buy a house in Puerto Rico. The, what I'm happy about also is that you were, that you know so much, um, you know so much about our history. Um, 250 schools I think were closed in Puerto Rico. So you're going there would be wonderful. They need teachers. We need doctors, we need teachers, we need lawyers. Um, I'm trying to take Julia Keller's spot. I'm trying to, I'm trying right to be the, the director of education of Puerto Rico. Right on. Reopen all of those public schools, make them equitable, make them accessible, make them just a space for young people to want to go and learn about themselves and empower themselves in these spaces. Unlike this privatization that they're trying to talk about over there. Well, what's happening is that, that that desire in your heart, I pray that God manifests it in a way that you hook up with people there. Um, people like uh, Malta Vega, 
who's there building an Africa house over there, right? In the east side there, the, the biggest black community there. Um, you could go there and work with her at teaching these kids. There are, there's loads for you to do there. There's loads for me to do there. The last time I went there, they told me, why don't you stay? And Iman, it took all my might to come back. All my might. I had to detox from what I call the adrenaline rush of New York City. You in New York, you may hate it, but you get used to the noise. You get used to the the energy, even if it leads you nowhere. You want to constantly be moving. In Puerto Rico, I was quarantined and I stayed there for two, and I just three months, and I had to sit down. My apartment, which I borrowed from a friend of mine, um, was right in front of the Atlantic Ocean. And I had to sit down and think about who I was. I couldn't continue to externalize my anxiety. I had to internalize it. What do you really want to do? Who are you, Felipe Luciano? I don't want to hear about who you were. You were a young lord, you were last poet, your father, you're now a grandfather. Who are you now? And why are you defining yourself in a box? When I've given you the ability, the youth, and the brains to continue to move, why are you doing this? And I sat down and there were times when I would cry. I was just crying because I'm still trying to figure out who I am. At this age, I'm still looking at, wait a minute, what can I do more? What's the next thing I can do as a warrior? And I've gotten some good ideas and I'm beginning to work them out. Um, to that end, the movement in Puerto Rico is slowly beginning to grow. Remember, it took a million people to get this chump out, Jose Dio. A million. It'll, it's going to take time, but I think the independents, they're going to understand, wait a minute, we have a Jones Act, which means that all of the products that come from outside have to go to Jacksonville, Florida, be put on another ship, which adds 30% more, and you're paying for that in Puerto Rico. They pay more for electricity. They pay more for orange juice. They make, they, they'll buy Purdue chicken when we have chicken on the island. We have everything we need to be an independent nation. But because we're colonized, we think theirs is better than ours. So hopefully with independence, we'll begin to take that to another level. And by the way, the mangos in Puerto Rico are unbelievable. And the cocos. And the cocos también, seguro. <laughs> we have the best pineapples in the world. We built the pineapple industry in Hawaii. We have it. Uh, there's, a, there's a brand there called Lotus, L-O-T-U-S. Uh, if Americans, uh, yeah, if they ever get, if they ever, get a hold of it, they'll forget about Dole and Del Monte. They'll go right into Lotus. Lotus. So we have so much to be proud of. It just takes people like you to begin to come over there in droves. Yeah, it does. <laughs> now, um, there's something gonna else. On. We're going to just move on to the next question. And yes. then hopefully like, we will be able to um, continue where we left off. But I'll just ask you, What's a misconception that your generation has about mine? And why do you think that that misconception is there? Our conception of the younger generation is that they don't read. They're ignorant about history. They don't read. We think, and we say this on the streets, there's no respect. There was a protocol that we had when we were growing up protocol about elders, a protocol about um, respect, a protocol about children, that doesn't exist anymore. So for example, my generation would not go around doing drive-bys and killing a one-year-old or four-year-old. That wasn't, you know, you need to kill somebody, you need to hurt somebody, go to that person directly. Um, there's a misconception about gender. You know, we think that all of the women are like the, the, in the old days. And we, we, we can't understand that women now are, are, are their own persons, their own, their own people. And it blows our minds when um, we talk to women or we talk to men and they have a whole different attitude about sexuality than we do. This is blowing our minds. Uh, we never saw this before. And, if it, and we know it always happened. Sexual, sexual fluidity always happened, but there, there was hypocrisy about it or rather fear about coming out. The other thing is, is, and I say this often about the Black Lives Matter thing, I don't think young people know if to fight, know how to fight, know where to fight, and know when to fight. You have to know, you have to be strategic about your battles. 
And I don't think that that's been happening too much. Um, I love the fact that they stood up and emoted. They stood up and said, we believe in these things, these things to be true and self-evident. And had it not been for them and their white counterparts, the, the white kids were out there too. We would never have, black, have had Black Lives Matter in our national dialogue. They came out, you guys came out, girl. I gotta give it to you. <laughs> the people came out. But now, how do you coalesce that force? How do you build leadership? How do you, um, what do you decide to focus on? Economic boycott? Do you want to hit him where it hurts? In his pocketbook? Demonstrations? Takeovers of institutions? How do you intend to do that? So we think that there's not been a lot of good uh, concrete thinking about tactics, because you need to do that. Um, and the tactics can be different. AOC is doing her thing. How do we back her up? How do we back Biden up? But people say, well, it's the same thing. It doesn't matter. It's not the same thing. The difference between Biden and, and Trump is, is gargantuan. Why would you sit there and just sit there on your hands and say, it doesn't matter? That's exactly what the fascists did in Germany. No, don't worry. He's a charlatan. He's a jerk. Let him go. No, Hindenburg should have been elected. It should have started and should have started toward a free democratic uh, Germany. We had a lot of problems with that. Um, so my generation feels that your, your generation um, does not have the, well, how can you have experience if you've never fought, but doesn't have the respect, nor the education, the scholarship, um, or the will to live, the will to fight. <coughs> I can definitely like understand um, that perspective. Also in the fact that like, I've been around a lot of different organizing, like youth led groups in New York City, and a lot of them just function extremely differently. Um, yeah. Whereas, like, the ones I have been a part of or have helped organize, I feel have been done with more strategy, um, specifically speaking on, on all the Black Lives Matter movements that have been going on. Whenever we have led protests and stuff, we have always made sure that our people are safe because we are responsible for our people. As an organizer, if you have a thousand people there, it is your responsibility if one of them starts looting, if one of them gets hurt. So you mean you actually plan for that? You actually do that? Yeah, like we we know that this is That's our responsibility wonderful. and we have like we make sure that we have like people within our org that are going through that are giving water every five to ten minutes that are checking in to make sure that there are no like undercover like cops trying to be young people in our crowds and start and like if we see something we always make sure we're communicating with each other we're always repeating to our people this is a nonviolent protest we are we are here to be safe and we are here to make a point. Well, we thought, uh, let me stop you there because this is amazing. I am amazed <laughs> that you're telling me this because we had to do the same thing in the Panthers and the Lords. I'm amazed because we kept on saying, why are they allowing those people to go up and, and, and throw rocks at, at police cars and all that stuff? That's crazy. Um, that is amazing. So so I wish that we could get that word out to everybody because all of the old people, esa gente eh, están destruyendo propiedad. Stop. Um, first of all, looting for me is sabotage. And anytime you sabotage the system, I don't have a problem with it. Be, but be that as it may, w the older people had the impression that you guys were allowing it to happen and you were thugs. That's what they were trying to say. They said the same thing about the Young Lords. They said the same thing about the Panther Party. So I love that you say that. That's wonderful that you have marshals going in, picking yes. up agents and telling them to leave. Yes, yes, and we are always on top of our people. Like we know that it is our responsibility to cre to make our people safe and create that environment for them. I feel like it's extremely like um, unorganized as an organizer if if you don't do that, it's just irresponsible. And so it's like interesting because even like younger generations or just the younger organizations I've been a part of, like we actually really look up to older activists or like to the to the activists of your generation and to the people of your generation we are inspired by them we are inspired by people like you by people like malcolm by people like asada shakur um and the list goes on and like i think like we really take from what we've learned in, in the civil rights movement um, in in the voting the voting movement in all of these different movements the LGBTQ movements and we just kind of study them 
um, and see what has worked and what has failed and try to like incorporate that into what are we doing now as organizers and as strategists. Um, and that's even why like one of the organizations um, I'm a part of is called Strategy for Black Lives because we need a strategy yes, you do. in order to, to get to the next step. It's not, it's not gonna be just protesting and going off. We have to learn how to now build relationships with people in government and get our voices there, help building policies for people in our community. Local government and local politics are so much more important than this grand national election. And I feel like a lot of New Yorkers and a lot of young people don't think that they're very focused on Biden and Kamala versus Trump right now, when it's who is our governor? Who is our mayor? Who is who is the the commissioner for NYPD? Who is the who is the chancellor for the Department of Education? Who are all of these people that are in our office that are affecting our lives, our parents' lives, our siblings' lives on a daily basis? Well, well, and, I, well, well I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, um, Kamala Harris. Um, is a national movement, is a national pride issue. And I think that what we have to do, and this happens as you get older, um, is yes, all politics is local, but you must not forget, I don't think, young people need to remember that we still live in a country that needs incredible infrastructural change. The structural racism is killing us. Mm -hmm. So I agree with you that we have to stay local and focus on local issues. But removing yourself from the electoral process puts us um, at risk. Of course, of course, yeah. No, I agree with that. I, I do think everybody should be voting like in this election, um, in like the presidential election, at the end of the day, like our voices, like people have fought and died for us to vote. That's and right. if we do not go and vote now. You're rejecting your grandmother. You're what? rejecting all of those black people who, who died for civil rights. Yeah. Um, yeah, women also, couldn't even vote at some point. And and now as a woman, if I don't vote, like it just it just doesn't add up. It does not make sense. Like even though the candidates that we do have, like now that are running, I, I Trump just has to really get out of he has to go. Well, he's the new fascist. He's the new Hitler. We don't understand how dangerous we, how dangerous a situation we're in. I think we're facing the greatest crisis this democracy has ever faced before. This is an experiment, uh, Ima. It's yeah. an experiment. This could go tomorrow. He is into dictators. He's into Hitler as his father was. He's into the Filipino president. He's into Brazil. He wants anywhere where he can exert authoritarian rule. He wants martial law. I have said this before. I brought up the word fascism two, three years ago. People said, oh, that's going too far, comparing him to Hitler. It is not going too far. This man is looking to establish martial law so he can stay in office. And don't be surprised if some incident is engineered so that he can say, you see what happened? There was a bombing here and, and the CIA and, and the intelligence department is behind it. At this point, his voter suppression, imagine what he, and he tells you to your face, I'm, the mail is not going to be in on time. So whatever the decision is on this election will not be, um, will not be credible because they got into late. Man is telling you, I'm, I'm not only going to beat you up, I'm going to beat you up and throw you in jail. This man is sick. And I think he's clinically sick. I think he's clinically insane. We need to, all of us, Black Lives Matter, white progressives, white conservatives need to save this. Women need to save this nation. And Latinos have to be particularly interested in this because too many of them, especially the evangelicals, are saying we support Trump. This is an unfortunate thing that happens in the Latino community. They begin to identify uh, with their colonizers. Yeah. They don't understand, they can't stand them. This guy will kill them. He'll put them in boxcars if he can. So it's important for us to get out to our own people and say, vote, 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 vote. Very, very important. And get these uh, old grandmothers, well, old, it's, it's like uh, an oxymoron. Let's try to get our people out there to, um, and bring them to the polls if we have to. Also, if you have a mail-in vote, do not put it in the mail. Go to the, ask the Board of Elections to find out and bring it to the Board of Elections. You bring it there. You see what I'm saying? So yeah. that they can't say it wasn't uh, it wasn't delivered. Um, I agree with you on that. Um, what is is this you on the picture? 
Yes, this is the show and tell. Yes, <laughs> tan linda, coño. Oh my God, yes. This was a picture that I selected um, that just like is extremely important um, to me. It's me and one of my best friends. We dressed up one Halloween. It was about four years ago. We were like, we're tired of like, Halloween being this day for people to just dress up and like go wild and do nothing. And so we were like, we really want to make a statement and really connect to what inspires us and what empowers us. And yeah. and although we live that on a daily, just putting on the actual like outfit <laughs> was like the perfect time to do it. And so um, that that's me and that's my friend Shanique, ella es dominicana de Harlem también. And um and just you know it's it's extremely empowering and now to be like talking to you, it's like I tried to look like you back then. <laughs> <laughs> I had a fro that big too. You did. Yes, I did. I had a big old fro. <laughs> In the people's church when they beat me up, that fro saved my life. It did, right? Cause, cause, but they wouldn't grab it. No, they hit. No, they didn't grab it. But they hit me. They in those days they had billy clubs, which were about, uh, one, two, three, almost a yard long, and they would hit you with that. I wish they had it today, rather than those rubber bullets to kill that take out eyes or bullets or these nine millimeters. Um, but a lot of us were beaten by those things. Uh, I was beaten very badly. Ended up with a bunch of stitches in my head and my arm broken in two places. Um, because uh, those of us who had come from the streets were used to cops and used to fighting them, we were able to fight and get away. These days, you don't fight and get away. They kill you. So mm -hmm. we had methods by which we would grab them um, and you know hit them back, but let nobody see you hitting them back. For example, we had one tactic where if the cop was uh, was grabbing you, we already were trained in martial arts. We did not believe that you needed to use guns in those days. At least we, we were close to the Panthers, but the New York City law demanded that for every gun you have, you spend a year in jail. And we didn't want to have to use all of our monies to bail our guys out. So um, we believed in martial arts. And we had some of the finest teachers in the world, I think, here. And so what would happen, for example, is as they approached us, and began to hit us with the clubs, we would go into their chest, into them, pull up, put our arms underneath their arms and say, stop it, you're killing me, you're killing me. And of course the guy was just, you know, he was just pushing us, you're killing me. Reverse punch, straight straight uh, snap kick, and then run at, run like hell to get away from there. They were always shocked by that. Uh, we were never shot, uh, and we didn't lose, when I was chairman of the Young Lords, we didn't lose one person. We lost one guy because he committed suicide in jail, but we didn't lose one person to death. I believed in maximum effectiveness, um, minimum loss of life. That was my mantra. And to this day, I'm very happy about that. We kept ourselves alive. As we should. That's awesome. Now I need to recommend my group to like do martial arts. <laughs> oh no, it is crucial. It crucial. is. That's so, that's so, I don't know why we haven't even thought of that. Like it's a self-defense martial arts not only against the police who are who are ridiculous sometimes, but also against guys in the street um, who have no consciousness. You know what I mean? They have to be. You know, don't, don't just come up on me like that, man. It's not. It's not. I, I don't feel it. You don't feel it. And if you do come that way, get prepared to get your ass kicked because I'm not gonna go for it. So that is, I think, all sisters, all young brothers should take up martial arts, all of them, and learn it. And if you want to stay in it, stay in it. Get a black belt. But you have to learn the, the fundamentals of martial arts. It's very important. Awesome. Thank you. Tell me about your picture. I see. This, is a, his, this is a historic picture. This is wonderful. Um, a group of us who still know each other decided to go uh, have a meeting. These are Panthers and Lords and Young Patriots. They were the white uh, progressives in our group. They came from Appalachia. And uh, it was Fred Hampton of the Black Panthers who said, we need a rainbow coalition. And so we would have people from all over. We would operate and demonstrate and talk and dialogue with people from all over our nation. We decided to meet in Seattle. The guy who has his hand over my shoulder is Aaron, Aaron Dixon. Aaron is a bad, he was chairman of the um, Seattle Panthers. 
Now, the reason I admire him is because, do you know what Seattle is? It's a logging town. It was, it's a real, you know, uh, white working class town that never, never was too brown on black people. And yet he organized the Panthers there in the 60s. You got to give him credit. Yeah. So I love Aaron um, very, very much. I talk to him all the time. Uh, he looks Puerto Rican. He's not, but he is. But, you know, we, we, we fluid. We can be anything. Um, as we often say, it doesn't matter where you're all black. You just went to different ports. So some of us are black and speak Spanish. Some of us are black and speak French. Some of us are black and speak English. The guy in the middle, um, and I can't remember his name. I can't remember the other people's names either, um, uh, was with the Young Patriots. They were the group that supported us as white guys. And when told to go into their communities, and to uh, raise the consciousness of white people, they did it. But when we had to come together for demonstrations, they were there. The gentleman to his right with the cane is a panther who spent 40 years in jail, 20 of them in, in, in isolation. And I, I remember hugging him and um, almost crying because you know what it is? If I'm quarantined for three months, I almost go crazy. He spent 40, 20 years in that. Um, so I give him very much credit. And the sister uh, was the first woman who joined the Black Panther Party. I wish I could remember their names, um, but I, I wish I could call them right now and get those names because Aaron, the guy in the um, in the checkered, the plaid jacket, the plaid shirt, knows all of them. And then there's me with my little bougie self. But we, we, we had a ball. We had a ball. We sat, we talked about tactics, and we talked about strategy. Um, I care for them very much. That's so beautiful. Um, I just wanted to comment on that. Like, that is... <sighs> It's really funny that a lot of the things that you're saying is just things that I am repeatedly seeing in my day-to-day -day life. And so, like, that whole coalition of um, all of you guys as organizers, as black and brown organizers, that's literally, like, what our organizations are doing right now, building a coalition of of organizers that have all been at the forefront of these Black Lives Matter movement because there's a lot of, like, competition and people in the game that like we have to say hey we're all in this together we have to create a committee um yep. that is leading this and 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 it's just literally that i'm so glad that we're living into to it let's remember that the government um has millions of dollars to spend on infiltration it's their job to have you fight each other yeah they, there are two kinds of uh, agents. There are agent prov provocateurs. These are the people who come to meetings and always, always take issue, excuse me, with the language, the tactics, and want to create arguments all night long instead of agreeing on a solid strategy. Um, these are agent provocateurs. Why do we do this? Well, either they're too militant or they don't want to do anything. But you can tell that they're not really there for the for the oneness of it. They just want to keep on asking questions and they want to meet forever. Meeting should not be that long. Take it, engage people and move on. Then you have the agent saboteurs. And those are the people who will start spreading all kinds of rumors. Oh, you know, I saw her kissing so-and-so and I saw her kissing that woman or I saw him kissing that man. You know, And starting rumors about you um, or about things that, that are just simply not true, to divide. The job of American intelligence is not to kill people, but to divide. If they have to kill, they will, but it's to divide. And once you're divided and arguing amongst yourselves, you're not effective. So what you're doing is right. Keep on meeting, keep on talking. And remember, Iman, keep a cadre of people around you that you know. You know their mamas, you know their daddies, you know where they come from, you know, um, their inner character, you know, their spirituality, um, and you're honest with them. Be always careful that even within the group that you that you have a small country of people who you love and who love you for who you are. I always say be careful to be, I like to celebrate, I like to be people with people who celebrate me. I don't care about how much you love what I did in the last pause, how much you love. There are times I need a, a, a bottle of milk. Are you going to do that for me? There are times I need to, um, Take a trip, you know, and I need to borrow. Are you going to do that? For me, the love of a person is what really counts. I have many of my friends who don't exactly agree with me, but they love me. And I like to hang around with people who celebrate me. 
If they don't celebrate you, I don't care how ideologically um, sound they are. Because there are a lot of people, power to the people, power to the people. But when you sit and cry and say, look, man, my mother just died. And I don't, they're not there for you. Or I just broke up with my partner. They're not there for you. You need people whom you love and who love you. That's very important. And who celebrate you. I'll say this too. If you're an eagle, do not hang out with pigeons. And I'm saying that to you, Iman. If you're an eagle, be careful with the you organize, but be careful that you don't end up with people who try to put you down because you're A, beautiful, B, smart, and uh, C, motivated. People will get mad at that, the jealousy, and they'll start now. So make sure that yeah. you keep them, huh? <laughs> so they have already started. Yeah. Keep them at arm's length. Say hello, what's happening, all of that, and keep moving. Drop them like it's hot, girl. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for that advice. Now, what concrete solutions can you offer to mine, to get as, extract from us as much as you can? What concrete solutions can you offer, Iman, to um, dig up the experience that we have as older activists? How can you do that? Hmm. So something that, like, I personally have been doing is just making sure that like i talk about our like ancestors and like the activists and organizers before us in order to learn from that if we do not learn our history and if we do not learn what has been done what has been already tried we're gonna go into this new world not a, not having any navigation and so it's really important for us to just um, make sure that we learn that and so i think like right now with gen z it's really interesting um, because learning looks different and everybody like thinks that like people are just on their phones, which there are many people that are, but there are also a lot of young people that are on their phones because that's where they get their constant information and learning from. Like I'm on Instagram 24 seven, but half of the people that I follow are activists, organizers, um, like platforms that talk about issues that I care about or issues that I want to learn more about. Um, and may, and like a lot of these platforms are highlighting activists of the past um that's many times sometimes i haven't he i have not even heard of um and i think like that's just extremely powerful and something that needs to keep happening like continue to circle that information um something i even wanted to bring is that as a co-founder um of integrate nyc we had to decide how are we going to build this infrastructure based off of what based off of whose experiences and Bla the black panthers and the young lords were literally what who we learned from we took the i believe it was like a 10 point platform from the black panthers and the young lords had a 13 point platform um and we sat with our young people and literally read through the point platforms right wrote on. It down and said what do we want to take from this and make it for our org um, make it relevant and, and reasonable for us. And I like I have been doing this and, and I think every young person and every young organizer and activist has to make sure that they look into their history, into our history and mm -hmm. learn from that and carry it and, and just be unprecedented because we don't wanna repeat everything that has happened. We wanna just take the good and transform and elevate. Well, I'll tell you something. There's a saying that those who don't read history um, are doomed to repeat it. Yes. And in terms of reading, and I hope I don't sound old and decrepit because they say you can't put new wine in old bottles, the Bible says. Um, but one piece of advice, if I may offer it, um, and I hope you're not offended by it, or anybody listening is not offended by it, please read. The internet gives you what we call superficial knowledge. You get a smattering of knowledge about something, but there's no way of, even with Wikipedia, it doesn't give you what you need, the substance of it. If you read books, newspapers, you're getting a lot more substance and you're able to, the, the subtlety, the nuance of a situation you can, you can begin to find out. There's a book about Puerto Rico. I'm pretty sure you've heard about it. It's called The War Against All Puerto Ricans. Do you have that? It's literally 
<laughs> it's literally up there on yeah. my shelf. That's a book that has to go out to your friends. You got to get borrow it or or yes. reproduce it so that they get it. Another book is um the uh, the, the House of Four Stories. Uh, mm -hmm. It talks about why Puerto Rico became the way it is. The House of Stor Four Stories, la, la Casa de Cuatro Pisos. Um, um, there is, of course, Joanna Fernandez's book on the Young Lords, which is excellent. Have you seen it? I haven't seen that one. It's on Amazon, The Young Lords by Joanna Fernandez. Um, it's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful book. And also- I have We Took the Streets. Pardon me? I have the one called We Took the Streets. Oh, that's Mickey Melendez, yes. Uh, he, he writes about, he was in The Young Lords. Um, and one of the guys who was there at the very beginning, um, a very wonderful man. Um, so if you if you begin to read, you get much more substance. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. not just reading knowledge. Um, I speak to um, young people all the time, and they they hit me with a smattering of information that sounds on the surface very smart. But when I ask them to prove it, to give me empirical evidence of what they're saying, they they don't have the books. They they haven't delved into it. You got to read. It's important. Um, you got to read Baldwin. You got to read Victor Hernandez Cruz, one of the great Puerto Rican poets. You got to read Miguel Algarín. You got to read these guys because these are the guys, men and women, um, who have Piri Thomas down these mean streets. Um, there are wonderful, wonderful people who have done tremendous literary work. So we need to read so we understand better who we are. So I think reading is important. Education is important. Just because you're an activist, we used to have a guy named Ramon Morales who was with us and wanted to go to Harvard. And there were several people in the party who did not want him to go. And I fought against them. Are you kidding me? Education can only make you a better revolutionary. So got to read. Got to continue learning. Um, God saved me from those revolutionaries who are militant and ignorant. You know what I mean? They, have, they, they just want to go fight and they don't know what they're fighting for. And they're willing, by the way, they're willing to give their lives. But mm -hmm. Papa, I don't want you to get killed or get other people killed. You know, yeah. so there has to be education is absolutely primary. Um, and that's it. I think that we're on the same path and I will help you in whatever I can. You need me for anything. You call me. Thank you so much. That means so much. <laughs> My question for you is how are you able to get our people back home to listen or confide in you as an Afro New Yorican? <sighs> The first thing that I had to do was not care about their opinions. Thanks. Colonialism gives us such a fear of Radio Bimba, we call it, the gossip circuit. And we're afraid to say I'm black and I'm very proud of it. And we're afraid to confront people because of that. So the first thing I had to do is say, Felipe, you're gonna go out on these streets, you're gonna talk to people. And if they come up with that nonsense about tu sabes que los negros, put them straight right away. So the first thing I had to do is establish confidence within myself. That's number one. I'm a black man. Um, Africa is my father. Puerto Rico is my mother. But that's where I'm coming from. Nobody's going to tell me, pero eso negro, eso cocolo, eso molleto. And I say, ¿y tu abuela dónde está? All of us have nappy hair. All of us have broad noses. All of us have, I go out there in the streets and I see Puerto Ricans all over the place and they're all black. But that's because we ended up in different boats. One went to Puerto Rico and another went to Charleston. Stop this nonsense. Most of the black people who were brought from Africa, especially from the Congo and Nigeria, ended up in Central and South America. Who are we kidding? Some are negro. Now, some might have gotten lightened up because what they did is they intermarried with the folk, particularly when the nation was getting black in Puerto Rico, they started importing English and Germans and Italians. That's why my name, my name is Luciano, Luciano. We have loads of people uh, in Puerto Rico who have foreign names uh, or European names, but that's because they didn't want the nation to get too black. They did the same thing in Cuba and they did, did the same thing in Puerto Rico and um, Santo Domingo or the Dominican Republic. So that's the first thing I had to do. The next thing I made sure of is that I knew the history of Puerto Rico better than they did. 
So cuando me acercaban con la mierda, I would say, no, 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 espérate, eso no pasó así. It didn't happen like that, baby. And I was able to break it down. And they were like, wow, this guy knows more about it than I do. So that was the second thing. Know your subject matter and be confident in yourself. The third thing I did um, is I had to listen, which I know you already know is hard for me to do. I always have an answer. You don't always think of an answer. But I had to sit back and listen to lo viejo and understand the culture. We as New Yorkers, we as Americans, continental Americans, are so fast, so quick, that we're not listening to our people. Listen to them. Don't, don't just think that, oh man, they don't want to fight. When I went there, I, I was saying, listen, I don't know why there hasn't been armed struggle yet. And they sat and explained to me, there's been armed struggle since the Spaniards came here. And they ran the whole thing down on me. I started to cry and cry because I had a different conception of my people. The Puerto Rico trip for me was transformative, Nina. I, I just couldn't believe it. Um, there's a love that our people have for each other that is hard to explain to other people. And as I've, li I've, as, as, as I've lectured to Black American audiences, I say, the one thing that we have in common is that we are family. That's the one, one value that we hold true, family. I said, now, if you can hook that up with Black people, what is the one thing? And I asked Puerto Rican audiences and Latino audiences, what is the one thing you can say about Black people that shines above all? And they say faith. Black folks have a faith that is unbelievable to me. After all they've been through to, to forgive nine people who go into church and kill your mama, I don't think so. But they were, the faith that they have has kept them alive. Yeah. Now imagine, it, imagine, senorita, if we can bring faith and family together. That's what I'm looking to do. We can bring those things together. We got America. It's ours. It's already ours. We don't know it yet. Wow. No, yeah, that that that's literally all it all that we need, and we just need to end that division and really promote that unity. Because that's how we would be undefeated once we have that family and that faith and that love. And isn't it amazing? Um, isn't it amazing that those values sound like Republican values, faith and family. But they are human values. They've taken it and perverted it. You see what I'm saying? They perverted it. But those are human values. And we, we need to stand up for that. And we need to stand up for our young people. If you came to East Harlem and you were walking, and you called me and said, Felipe, I'm walking to 121st. Can you come down and help me walk the girl? I'd be down in a minute. My job is to protect you. My job is to put my life on the line for you. That's what I'm here for. That's what warriors do. And I think as long as we remember that, as long as the older people remember that, I'm here for you. I'm your daddy, your grandfather, your uncle. That's who I am. And if we can remember to always take care of our youth and offer them as much understanding and compassion as we can. We're gonna win this thing. That's literally, that's literally all we need. Thank you so much for that. I really like was just internalizing everything that you were saying and just connecting it to my own experiences and thoughts. And I am totally aligned with like what you said about our perception of what we think the Puerto Rican people want until we actually have to go there and hear them out and, and hear their stories and learn our history and read our history. Um, because that that's the only way that we'll ever be able to learn from it and, and improve our lives um, as, as individuals and as a community and, and just as a country. I think so. I Thank think so. you for that. You're very welcome. I would hope that we begin to reconstitute. There are three things that I hope we could do. A, give our children, incentivize them to finish school, number one. Number two, build families. No revolution succeeds without families. I know, and I tell brothers and sisters, and I tell partners, I know she got mad at you and she walked out and all that, but if you are in love, I didn't say love now, in love, you stick with this. 
Families are the backbone of any revolutionary movement. Um, and three, take care of your families and take care of your children. Uh, I've seen so many revolutionary families who got so involved in the revolution that they forgot their children and the children have been traumatized. We need to stop moving so fast that we forget that those babies need love, that they need to be held, that they need to be stroked, that they need to, I don't care what demonstration you have the next day. If your daughter or your son wants you to go to the Brooklyn Museum, or they want you to go to a Museo del Barrio, or they want to go to a baseball game, whatever, you go with them. There will always be time um, to um, to die. They don't. They're, 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 there's not enough time to live. So we have to take care of them because a very famous lady told me this one day. Very famous. She's now dead. She said, "Felipe, the greatest act of a re of a re of a revolutionary is to raise healthy children." And I was into the bluster and the fluff and the. The fire, no, we gotta go against this. And she said, raise a healthy child and you've added to the revolution. And I think she was absolutely right. As I got older, I realized how, how, healthy, how uh, important a statement that is. Anyway, um, it's been wonderful talking to you. If there's something else you wanna ask me, ask me. I think we've just about gone to take um, around We can, I would love to just definitely connect with you after this. Sure. Um, and I just, even if we could meet up what after this whole Corona thing um, ends, hopefully in person, that would just be like, and have a conversation. I have so many other things I would love to ask you and connect well, you, with. We can, do it, we can do it before the Corona thing. Just put on a mask. If you need the gloves, that's all. And we sit okay. we we okay. six feet from each other and we can talk. Oh my God, don't, okay. Don't let this isolate you. So don't let this isolate. See, this part of this is to keep you isolated so that you get depressed. It is, it is. It hey, is. Forget okay. those people. So then that totally works. So I'm definitely going to to keep in contact with you and set it up and 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 set it up. Yeah, I'm just so excited. Thank right. you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. I learned so much and this is just super powerful and empowering and just I feel so full right now and, and humble. So Thank you. Thank you so much for this. Just remember my life, I was put here to defend you. I was put here to protect you. I was put here to love you into fullness. That's what I'm here for. That's what warriors do. So do not feel you're imposing on me by doing that. My job is to take care of you. My job is to go like this and pass the baton onto you. And that's it. Wow. Yes, okay. Thank you. thank you. And that is also my responsibility as a youth activist to continue that and to hold that. and. That's even why I wanted to be a teacher. That's a whole other conversation. But well, that's, yeah, that's, that's the most revolutionary job in the world. And pass the revolution to our young, our younger people. That's the most revolutionary job in the world to teach. I it, am who I am because I'm because of my teachers, and they were public school, and many of them were white, but they were progressive, and they helped me get to this point. Saul Resnick, Ethel Shapiro, uh, uh, who else? Um, well, those are the two that I remember. Mr. Rabinowitz in the sixth grade. You'd be surprised. All of them Jewish Americans, by the way, who really, yeah. really gave me a sense of what revolution was like, what progression was like, um, and grew me into the man that I am. And I was into gangs. Uh, I was fighting all the time. I had so many anger issues. They put me away for a while. They said, listen, you like gangs, you gotta go away. Um, but I came out a transformed man. Jail revolutionized me. And I went to Queens College, and um, after that, I joined the Poets, and I joined then after that, the Young Lords. But I'm, it was, me, I'm City College. Right on, right <laughs> on. Stay with it, stay with it. See. Stay yeah. with it. <laughs> well, God bless you, take care of yourself. Igual, thank you All so right. much. You know where to get me. I will, I'm gonna email you 